to um, reorganize and, and kind of decide what's important. Um, and so Kate and I spent the majority of the day yesterday kind of cleaning out some areas that we've honestly been meaning to clean out for months and months and months and stuff gets in the way. And the reality is, um, I, in fact, I was talking to Jeff uh, about this topic before we kind of started. Um, but a good way to think about it, and I hadn't really thought about this until this morning, is, you know, a lot of us save wood, you know, melamine, or we'll save a form that we made or whatever. Um, but how much space do that, does that take up? I mean, a lot of us are in small shops. I'm not in a huge shop. Um, and so, you know, it, it would not be a stretch to say that the fluff, the extra, the stuff I don't use every day um, or even every week or every month uh, probably takes up 8, 10, 12 percent of my shop. And if you do the math based on what I pay for rent and I have fairly inexpensive rent, that's two hundred dollars a month, um, you know, in in usable space that I'm paying for that's not being used because I've got something stored there that I don't use. So, you know, if your rent is, you know, back in Orlando, my rent was three times what it is uh, here in, in North Carolina. Um, and so that was a really big deal because I had probably 15% of that shop that I did not use on a daily or even monthly basis. Um, and so, you know, we just thought this was a really, really important topic to bring up and discuss because uh, a lot of us accumulate things over the years. Um, a lot of us have been, I mean, Jeff, you've been in that shop for at least 10, if not 12 or 14 years. Um, and, and a lot of us, you know, accumulate stuff that we don't even realize we have until we throw it away because we didn't use it. So, so yeah, you're right. Um, it's kind of spring cleaning for me. Um, and I wanted to cover more than simply just organizing stuff because it's an obvious and a good place to start. So your shop, your shop space is the engine and the universe where you make your money. That's where your business lives. And having all the accoutrements of making concrete, your tools, your materials, your casting tables, your molds, the pieces in production, all those have to live somewhere. So talking about or how to organize things and, and, and all that is, a, is, a, is gonna be the bulk of this discussion, but I wanna even expand it beyond just the physical, because organization spans all aspects of a business. And right. if you watch or learn or read about or listen to other people who have nothing to do with concrete as a business, but they're talking about how to run a successful business, being organized is critical. And it's something that's a challenge for everybody. So we're talking about being organized about your time, your scheduling, your materials, your supply chain, um, all those kind of things, your labor, like your the people you employ, the people maybe you hire, all that. And well, that's a, that's I would interject a, is that is that sometimes we're not good at that. You know, yeah. I'm that is not a strong suit that I have, um, and it has taken me a long time to realize that, despite my best efforts, sometimes that's not something. You know, sometimes something you're not good at that is not in your you know, strong suit wheelhouse may be something you need to staff and that's okay. Or find, um, you know, other solutions. Like, I don't know. I have a Google calendar that I put everything on that reminds me. So I don't have to think about it. So if mm -hmm. I've got a dentist appointment or I got to take the dogs for their vet appointment, or I got to get the oil changed. I made an appointment for it. Don't write it down, put it on a calendar, set an alarm so that it's on your phone, it's on your computer. Uh, you've got a meeting with a customer or that somebody wants to come in your showroom or you need to order, um, I need to order more pigment for this project coming up. Yeah, well, and when, I, like for me, I, I'm bad at that too. You know, if, if it's not in my calendar, both, um, like a day, 24 hours ahead of time and an hour ahead of time, it will not happen. And I've told, you know, and so, um, you know, like I've got a meeting at 930 and um, well, and it's tentative. It's, it's, it's loose. It could be at 10 o'clock. I'm not trying to cut this thing, you know, off, but um, you know, with a, 
And so, you know, but Kate needs to know about my meetings so that she doesn't put stuff on top of mine. So I have to schedule it on both my calendar and hers. And that's a habit I'm forming, right? So. So let's start with um, being organized in terms of your shop space. Now, everybody starts someplace. I started in my garage and I will now be on my fifth separate physical shop in the last 24 years. Um, and every shop is laid out differently. It, the, the sizes are different, where things are in the shop, the space, where the doors are, how big they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no one uh, formula for, oh, you should do this here and that there. Mm -hmm. But like, and I have an article on the CCI website that talks about the general concepts of setting up a shop in terms of work has to flow. Like, what every project, you know, if you've been to one of my classes, the very first thing I talk about when when we start talking about how to do all this stuff is every project has seven or eight critical steps. And if you're working on, say, a kitchen or a bathroom, you come in and, and templating is the first physical thing you do. And then everything flows from that. Templating to forming, forming to thinking about reinforcing um, in the old school days, when you actually pre GFRC days, you actually had to create meshes or grids of reinforcing steel or wire. Um, nowadays, you don't really have to do that, but you should still be thinking about it. And then from there, it goes on to casting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a logical path. You climb the mountain, you start at the base, you go to the top. And every, the process is, uh, is a fairly linear one. Um, and you always should be thinking about what ha what's not just the next step, but what are the next several steps so that you're not having to undo what you did to go backwards. And I don't want to get too far into that, but setting up your shop is part of that process. It makes that process easy. So where are you going to do your wet processing or wet, wet casting? I call that the messy area. Where do things get messy? You spray, you pour, you mix, you wash, et cetera. Where's that happening? You don't want that next to where you store your cement or where mm. your expensive tools are. So the logical setup is the beginning of that. And to come back to what Caleb just said about not accumulating fluff, you know, as you work and, and have more projects under your belt and, and maybe you've settled into things for a year or two years or whatever, you're going to have oh, I got this mold that I made for this past project and I really like it and I think I might use it again. If you don't have a space to store it and walls are a fantastic way to store things because it's up off the floor. So in a mm. sense, if you have a shelf on a wall, you're doubling the floor space, the, sort of the shadow perimeter of that. So you can store twice as much stuff within that footprint of the shelf. And if you mm. have more than one shelf that are stacked, you get even more. So if you can do that and it's not dis disrupting or disturbing your ability to, to do your work, then that's fine. But if you have this say, oh, I got this cool planter mold that I made for this one customer and it's sitting in a corner and you got to walk around it or move around it and you do that week after week, month after month, Get rid of it. It's not worth it. Or that that cutoff, that scrap piece of melamine that, well, it's it's about that wide and about that long. And I might use it. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. You know, I'm it, yeah. you gotta well, have I mean, goals. You gotta be disciplined about it. Absolutely. And and I'm I'm learning that, you know, again, firsthand for the 50th time, right? Uh -huh. Um I have uh I have infrared heaters that are natural gas in my shop. I've got two of them. I bought three. Uh, it was a deal. I, it was on like Facebook Marketplace or something. I got three for three hundred bucks. I don't know. It was they were used. It was great. I converted two of them to natural gas. I ended up having to harvest a part off of one of them to make the other two work. And so I've got one thirty foot burner just stacked in a corner, and it's been there for I, I installed the heaters. I guess it was a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have had the thought. Well, I could put it in the showroom, but they're really not pretty, and it's a showroom. So, um, hang on, I've got, I need to answer. Well, I'm, I'm not going to answer the call, but I need to answer this text so that this person stopped calling me. Yeah, so um, the, the but point is, my point being is, yesterday, I'm like, 
what, is it just going to sit there forever or am I going to sell it? Like if I made 50 bucks on it now, like that's space, right? Um, and then, you know, additionally, they were propane when I bought them and I did not have a natural gas in the shop when I bought them. So I bought 200 pound propane tanks, big, you know, tall ones. Um, now I have natural gas, right? So the only thing I can use these things for is like my torch, like the weed torch they used, you know, I dry pieces occasionally with it, right? That isn't, I can get a little, a, a grill cylinder is plenty for that. I don't need 200 pound things. And, you know, I think I paid 180 bucks a piece for the things empty and they're full right now. So I was, I was like, well, shoot, I'll, I'll get rid of them and I'll make $400. I listened on Facebook marketplace for $400 and 12, 12 hours later or less, I got somebody saying, hey, I'll come pick them up tomorrow. Yep. Like, great, cool. That's space. And, you know, an extra, you know, couple of dollars. So, you know, think about these things, right? So, so getting rid of unnecessary things is, is the, is the logical first step, right? I've been in my space for a little over 12 years, got a lot of accumulated crap. I threw out a, a wooden jig I made for my table saw years ago. I don't even know when I made it and I've been holding on to it. I probably used it once in... 10 years. It's not big, but it's one of the, it's, it's the concept is it takes up space. I got to have a place to put it And that place. It's cluttered. It collects dust. Um, visually, emotionally, it's, it, you know, it's like barnacles on a ship. One or two is not bad, but when you, you keep saying, it's just, I got a little bit more. It's not a big deal. All of a sudden your shop becomes overrun with things you don't need that, that are in your way. And yeah. I've had the good fortune to be able to travel around the world and see a lot of people's shops. And frankly, I don't think I keep the most organized shops. I've been into some in some shops that are very impressively organized. And I applaud those folks who have the discipline to set it up to where everything has a place and everything's maintained that way. And I've also been in shops where, you know, I'm trying to help somebody do something and they're like, well, where's your, where's your, you know, screw bit that I need? Oh, it's over there. And it's a pile and it spends 20 minutes looking for it. Right. That's the next topic is organizing the tools you need to have. And years ago, um, the biggest shop I ever had was a 7,000 square foot shop. And my shop manager, Brad, uh, was more organized than anybody I've ever seen. And I have the, you know, the big rolling tool cabinets, the big red ones with the drawers that mechanics use. Well, I have, I have like five of those and they're full of tools. And he labeled every one of them. So I have a drawer of hammers. And if you've been in my class, if you've been in the CCI class, you know, where are the hammers? They're in the hammer drawer. Mm -hmm. Where are the tape measures? They're in the tape measure drawer. Where's the tape? It's in the drawer labeled tape. So when you use it, it's where you expect it to be. And when you're done using it, it goes back in that drawer. Now that doesn't mean, okay, I put it down, I'm assembling a mold and I put the drill down, I have to go put it back where, you know, but put it back at the end of the day so that in the morning, everything's reset. And you would be surprised how efficient you are and how relaxing it is to work in a space where you don't have to stress about, do I have that tool bit? Because right. it's, it, it goes even beyond that. It's, it's not just, where is it? But do I have it and is it in good condition? Do I have enough Phillips or number two square drive or a number T25 Torx bit? Do I have the right length? Do I have the right number? Uh, are they chewed up? It lets you kind of stay on top of things. And I've never been in the military, but I, I used to work for the Navy and I worked with some really, really sharp ex-military people who they had the discipline and that was kind of baked into them. Not just they were born with it, but it was instilled on them to be organized, keep everything clean, keep everything in good working order, maintain your tools because you don't know when you need them. And especially in that situation, that's even more critical. But for us, you know, you got a hopper gun. Okay. Make sure it works, clean it, tear it apart, grease it, oil it, whatever it takes, replace the parts that don't work, so that when you need it, you pick it up, you know it's going to work. You don't have to then go, oh, geez, the, the trigger sticks, or I lost the nozzle, or where did that go? 
it's all part of a discipline of being organized. And when you start doing that with the physical things, I think it makes it easier to move towards a broader, more philosophical point of view of, of being organized. Um, do you have anything to add, Caleb? Yeah, I mean, I think too, you know, there are going to be things that you need to have that you don't always use, okay. right? So a hopper gun's a great example in my particular business because I don't spray things very often anymore, at least at this stage, right? I've gone through various stages where I've done different styles predominantly. And right now my predominant style is self-consolidating uh, direct cast backer. Mm -hmm. What I like to do, it's working really well for me. My clients are happy with it. So that's what I'm doing, which means I'm not spraying very often. And some something that I've run into is that, you know, okay, well, the hopper gun was cleaned well and it, it worked well last time I used it, but maybe it hadn't been used in six months and I haven't taken it apart since then. And it was wet last time. So maybe it's stuck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, take the time once a month, once a quarter to inventory the tools that you have that you need that you don't use often and clean them. That's a fantastic point. Yeah. Because um, when you need it, you need it. It's like insurance, right. right? You don't need it till you need it. And when I had a, a big shop and I had a big, I had a, not a big crew, but I had a crew and you go out to template, right? So for those of us who go out and do templating and I, I still do the old stick, glue stick and, and door skin, Caleb used the strips of, um, uh, was it core plastic, the corrugated plastic sheeting, um, both very, very effective. I had a separate toolkit for templating. I still have it. Um, it's a little bag that has everything I need, has a tape measure, has the cutter, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. knives, glue stick, Label template, I've got everything in it. Same with installation. Um, I would keep, I had a shelf, you know, one of those wire shelves, next to the one of the roll-up doors. And I had duplicate tools that were only used for installation. Cordless drills, caulk guns, knives, measuring tapes, broom, dustpan, shop vac, you name it. It was only for templating. I mean, only for installation, sorry. It wasn't used during production. It wasn't used to build molds. No, Nobody was allowed to take things from that to use elsewhere. Because when you go to install, you know, it takes time to gather stuff. Well, if it's already gathered and it's already where you expect it, and I had a checklist of an inventory of what should be loaded. So you don't have to think about it. It's mm -hmm. already done. And that's part of the organizational um, process that I that I'm that we are trying to instill is this is really important because if you have to spend 15, 20 minutes thinking about stuff, wandering around your shop. Looking I mean, historically, I haven't been able to get, because I haven't done this until recently, you know, it's like, what time do you think you'll be there to install? It's local, right? 1130, maybe, because yeah. I've got to find everything and put it in the kit and load it up. And then I got to load the pieces up and then I got to do the, and, you know, the, the times recently where we've said, no, we're installing on Monday or we're installing on Friday. So we're going to get everything together the work day before. Yep. So, you know, and we do have a, a, an extensive checklist that, and and I've got a Milwaukee pack out. That's my install kit, right? And so it's stacked and the boxes Beautiful. are numbered mm -hmm. and the trays inside the boxes are numbered. So, you know, we have a list, box one, tray one, this stuff, box one, tray two, this stuff, box one, base, this stuff. And Kate and I go through it, mostly Kate, um, the royal we, if you will, um, go through it before every install and make sure everything's on there. Yeah. And then we put it at the door. And, uh, you know, I had, I had duplicate tools of, I had like quadruplicate tools of everything, um, before the flood and I have not reaccumulated everything. So I, I still do steal from my regular tools to go to install. Uh, You're still recovering time. from that, that, that massive. Takes a while, you know. yeah. But, uh, you know, so point being, uh, ideally, you know, if, if we, seal on a it's ideal in my shop and it doesn't always happen but i like to seal on a thursday uh -huh. so that i can load on a friday and install on monday and i can you know because if i can load on friday um you know kate's not in the shop on friday she works four tens and so friday is a day when i do a lot of appointments and i do a lot of housekeeping and i do a lot of 
you know, I can load stuff by myself because I have a forklift. So, um, you know, it's ideal if we can seal on a Thursday and then load all the stuff in the trailer, not the, I mean, the, the pack out stays inside because I lock it, right? Um, but load the pieces in the trailer and have the, the pack out ready. Then I can come in at 730, put the pack out in the truck and drive away. Mm -hmm. And that makes a huge difference. You know, uh, two weeks ago, I was in New York City on a, a spring break last week. But the week before, um, I had an install of a kitchen island. And uh, I had, it was a big kitchen island, um, took about six people to move it. And I did not have access for carts. So totally separate aside thing is you should have a total layout of your job site before you go. So, um, you know, which we cover in other things and we don't need to get into it. But, um, you know, I knew that I could not use a cart to get this island in the house. Not possible. The, it had large stairs, but the stairs went under an overhang. And so cart, not possible. Um, it would have taken eight people to move a cart with the piece and it took six people to move the piece. So piece it was. Um, and so, uh, you know, coordinate all my people and, and a lot of them are volunteer friends of mine. And I'm sure all of you, you know, or a lot of you have, have dealt with that where it's like, you know, you've got two or three people or maybe just you in your shop. And so when you're installing, it's like, oh, I got to find people. Mm -hmm. So you coordinate those people at a certain time, right? So I had to meet them at nine o'clock on site. So I had to have my stuff and my piece ready to go before then so they could be there at nine o'clock. So um, it's critically important that, that these things get done. And, you know, these are lessons that, at least for me, are probably going to be, you know, a lifelong <laughs> endeavor uh, to learn. And you just get incrementally better if you go. I grew up, now my dad's not the most organized person. Um, his workbench always was basically a big pile of stuff. And he tried to be organized, but that's just not how his mind works. Um, and I kind of inherited that early on. And I also discovered that you can't, it's okay to do it for yourself. But as soon as you start bringing other people into the fold, you have employees, or just time, like, I got to get this done. I got to build these forms. I got to do whatever I need to do. And you only have so much time. You all of a sudden are faced with the the hard, the cold, hard truth that the way you do things isn't really working. And it's, it's hard to be disciplined. Putting things back, taking the time to clean up is, that takes discipline. And if you bu start building that culture early, especially with new employees. Um, it really makes a difference. We always had every Friday, every Friday afternoon, two hours before the end of the day, no more work was getting done. It was do an inventory, see how much pigment we have, see how much cement, how much sand, et cetera, et cetera. Clean up. All the tools are put away. Tables are clean. Floors are swept. Our wet processing area, we always power wash the floor. We did that every day. So well, and you'll find there's no accumulation of stuff. Right? Because you're if you if you don't do those things in the name of productivity, yeah, then that will that, that's a very short term thing. You know, that's gonna work for you for three days, yeah. maybe three weeks, maybe a month if you're lucky, but then your shop is gonna be completely trashed. It's gonna take at minimum three, four, five days of what would be very productive time to get it back to okay. Yeah. So if you can get it amazing. Now, uh, one thing I, I will say, a phrase I heard recently that I that I quite like um, is perfection is procrastination. Mm -hmm. So don't don't spend your life chasing the perfect setup. It's not going to happen. But chase and and set up something that you believe will work for you in the stage that you're in do it and then keep it that way and then when it, you know when it comes time that you're like oh this isn't working for me let's change it take the week and change it i mean it's fine you know i i've always had all my equipment or as much of my equipment on wheels mm -hmm. as possible table big cabinet saw you know seven foot wide cabinet saw it's on wheels i bought it that way my dust collector, it's on wheels. Not that, I mean, I got a big dust collector. You have the bigger one, but mine's like eight feet tall. Um, oh, it's on wheels. The only difference in size is the motor. We had a tiny right. Yeah, the, the, the inlet and the motor size. But 
it's on wheels and now it's hard plumbed against the wall to to where the uh table saw is but that the ability to place it if i wanted to change it or move it or shift it for whatever reason i could um where my chop saw is it's mobile right and until i know this is where i want to be working i can move it around now things like you know we both have very big air compressors that are essentially you need a forklift to move them or you know pallet jack they they're stationary tuck it in a corner but you know stuff like where your casting tables are even or even tool cabinets you know there's nothing wrong with moving stuff around and bringing it i want to be working so all my all the tools i need for building forms measuring tapes screw guns screws etc get a small tool cabinet that's mobile and bring it to you instead of you walking back and forth like my the biggest shop I had was seven thousand square feet, so it was a seventy by one hundred foot steel building, no columns inside. That's amazing. When it's a hundred feet away, and you got to go back and forth several times a day because the stuff is way over at the other side of the shop, and you get some exercise, right? You get your steps in. Not that that actually means anything, but it's a lot, lot of wasted time. It's like, well, move that over here, or bring the stuff more centralized so that. You know, if you're use if you need some stuff at one end of the shop and you need the same stuff at the other end of the shop, put it in the middle. You know, that seems to make sense, but I've I've been in shops where things aren't laid out very well. Um, and I want to get back to cleaning because that's that's really important too. Um well and if stuff's on wheels, you can pull it out and sweep under it. Because yeah, I mean exactly dust uh, and trash and stuff slip under a ton of stuff. I had a dust a wood and and thing. Just yeah. interior air quality is very important, especially nowadays. Um, we work with the material that is, if you don't clean it up right away, the amount of effort it takes to get rid of it goes up exponentially. You know, you got concrete on a trowel. You just finished scraping a bucket. Have a rinse bucket, clean it now. It takes 10 seconds. Set it down, come back in an hour, it's going to take several minutes to clean it. Leave it till tomorrow, it's going to take an hour to clean. Maybe not, but I mean, you get the point, right? Do things now rather than put it off till later because it takes less time, there's less to do. And more importantly, it builds the habit of doing it continuously, being aware of staying organized, being clean is organized always being aware of what's the next step? What do I need to do next two steps down away from, from where I'm at now? And am I making a decision that's gonna cause me to spend more time? It's like shuffling things around. Like I'm literally spring cleaning. It's like, okay, let's get rid of this, moving things around. Well, if I say, I wanna move a shelf that's got all this stuff on it. If I take the stuff, off the shelf and put it where I want to put the shelf. That's just making more work for myself because I'm not thinking I'm not being organized. So it helps to have that bigger picture in mind and just kind of don't, don't be a slave to it, but just be aware that time is money. Space is money and being organized and being efficient means your profitability stays high stays where you want it you know we we all operate at profit margins that we wish were higher well we make choices that diminish that that cut that down that that make it a lot less desirable but we don't know that you know spending time wandering around looking for something and here's a good here's a good example of being organized when you template a job or you, let's say you're designing a piece of furniture for a customer and you get that contract. Yeah. you got the green light. You got to go. You got a contract. You got a deposit. That's the moment you do your mix design. You do all your mix calculations. And if you use my mix calculators, you know exactly how easy that is. It tells you all the ingredients you need to have. So now you go back and you look at your inventory, or if you don't keep one, an, an active one, you go out in your shop and you look at do I have the pigment for it? Do I have enough cement? And that's the moment to buy things, to order it. Because it might take 
days or weeks to get a critical ingredient in that could hold up your project. Yeah, um, exactly. So again, that's the, the bigger picture of organization beyond just, you know, having your tool drawers labeled. Yeah, and I think I think really, you know, the, the the bones of the point that we're getting at here is, you know, these are these are things that we believe are critically important to the success of any business, especially one that involves a lot of moving parts and pieces and tools. And, um, and you know, again, not everybody, myself included, has that skill set uh, off, the, you know, offhand. It's like I grew up and I was I was very um let's call it subpar at math. I'm decent at it now because I need it. Um, and so, you know, there, there are going to be things that are going to take a long time to learn and and because you got to retrain essentially your nature. Now, if you're a super organized person, great for you, you have an advantage. Um, but I find that a lot of makers and a lot of artisans and a lot of artists, um, our brains are very disorganized. Um, and so, you know, I, I equate this a lot to how I feel at home because um, my wife is a very, very organized person. And I find that my brain uh, tends to function better at home because it's organized and that is not my doing. And so, um, you know, I, I can keep it that way. I can live within a system that's created. And so what I've tried to do at work is uh, create that system where, you um, my brain can function at its best, uh, you know, and so often that means staffing that weakness. It may not be your strong suit and that's all right. Um, but it might be some, it might be that you need to hire somebody to pressure wash once a week. It might be that you need to hire somebody to help you put systems in place and then yell at you when you don't do them. Um, you know, it, it might be any number of things to staff that weakness. Um, you know, and, and, you might be the staff to the weakness of an employee that you have, you know, keeping them on task. So all of that to say, you know, we're not preaching from a high horse here. Like I struggle with this a lot and I'm talking about it because I'm somewhat talking to myself. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a lot of room here for conversations and a lot of room here for, you know, what works for you, what works for you, what works for you. Um, you know, and, and, that's one of the reasons too that we like to get people together physically as well uh because you know i find that there's a lot of growth in in uh you know in conversation in general but also particularly in person so. yeah um checklists are fantastic ways they're like living living external documents living external memory um or reminders for things Templating checklist, installation checklist, uh, project management checklist. Uh, what's the sequence of all the things you need to talk about and do with a, a new customer from the time they inquire about your, your services to the time, you know, you take their check and shake their hand and walk away. You know, what are all the things that go into that? Um, let's say, let's use installation as a, as a good example, because this is something that's bitten a lot of us, you know, you're going to do, uh, use a kitchen for example, because a lot of people still do kitchens and a lot of people love doing kitchens and some people hate them, but it doesn't matter. We'll use this as, as an example. You've, you know, schedules, you talk to the, let's say, you, you, let's say your, your point of contact is the GC. So that's who you're contracting with. Right. And, uh, you call them on a Monday and say, hey, you know, we're we're a little ahead of schedule. When when is good for you? We can we can install uh next uh Tuesday or next Wednesday, let's say. And they say, let's do Tuesday. Okay, cool. How many of us have loaded up, driven out? Maybe it's a half an hour away, maybe it's two hours away, maybe it's six hours away, maybe it's further. Um you get to the job site Tuesday morning and uh, they're not ready for you. What do you do? How do you prevent that from happening? You know, so it's not enough just to have a phone call. It's let's have a checklist so that we know what to do. But that physical checklist of 
what do we need to have from them so they get the checklist. Um, that's part of our project management uh, uh, program is here's what we need to have from you. I need to have a clear space to park. So I'm not carrying slabs up a 300 foot hill around vans and trucks that are parked in my way and et cetera, et cetera. You get the picture, right? Um, I've gone in to template, for instance, where they said they were ready. They signed a document saying they were ready and all the millwork for this two-story house was stacked on the kitchen cabinets. You're not ready. You know, I don't have clear, easy access to that. That's being organized. And that's part of that is also holding people accountable because they are always going to hold you accountable for what they think you should be. So being a professional, um, this this organization extends well, holding, holding outside of your business. Standard is going to actually make them respect you more as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, you know, we we could go on and on with examples, but the the point of making it a cultural thing in your business to think about organization think about efficiency think about wasted space wasted time wasted opportunity um and how you can start whittling away at that you know catch the low hanging fruit first do the big things empty the trash scrape your floor that sort of thing and then really start refining things because you'd be surprised at how more pleasant it is to work in a shop where you don't have to look down at the floor because it's so uneven from chunky chunks of concrete that have just accumulated over time you don't have to worry about tripping on the floor um now maybe you've inherited a shop like caleb your last shop you inherited a shop that where the floor was like potholes like you couldn't Ooh. it was and there was so much of it you couldn't really do anything about it it wasn't your doing, that's just how it was. Mm -hmm. But I've been in shops where a hundred percent of the reason the floor is uneven is because of laziness. You know, you got excess concrete, you you scrape it onto the floor and you don't clean it up. That's just lazy. Um, mm -hmm. And that really hurts productivity. And it potentially hurts your profit because, you know, you're pushing a cart across a, a, an uneven floor and you crack a slab. Well, now you have to redo that. So, I mean, that's an extreme example, but. Sure. So, um we should probably bring it home. Yep. Uh, it's 45. So, um, you know, uh, want to kind of open it, you know, if you have any questions, sir, uh, I think you're the, you're the only one on at the moment. So, uh, you know, if you have any questions, we also want to, um, you know, anybody has questions, comments, uh, you know, the, the, the podcast will be open for comments after it's yeah. posted. So. And, uh, you know, we'd like to, you know, write in or send us photos of what is your shop? Like what, how, what organizational tip do you have you developed that you find works really well for you and you would like to share that with people because everybody's different like we're we all some people are left-handed some people are right-handed some people are amphibious if you get that that quote um and it's 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 refreshing and also very very helpful to see how people choose to organize how they do things their their processes and 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 how they organize themselves so any thoughts well if not i think we're going to wrap this up thank yeah. you for joining us it's been great always good to you know i think it's always a, a really nice thing to discuss things that you know, again, multiple perspectives um, and everybody does things differently. So you can always learn from a conversation. So. Right. Right. Till next time. Thanks Til a lot. Till next time. See ya. Bye-bye.